Hello and welcome to the Third Sector Podcast. I'm Lucinda Rouse. And I'm Emily Burt. Each week we bring you half an hour of discussion and debate about the important goings on in the charity world. This week we'll be thinking about volunteering and how a volunteer journey can be best managed from the recruitment stage all the way through to the exit interview. But first, we're joined by our senior news reporter, Emily Harl, to talk about a recent piece of charity news. You might have seen it on the telly. Unless you've been under a rock, you'll know the London Marathon, the world's biggest annual fundraising event, took place this weekend. Already, the race has broken a fundraising record. So the 26.2 mile race around the capital streets has already raised a whopping £67 million so far breaking the existing world record for the highest amount raised by a one-day fundraiser. Amazing. I mean, the marathon total's been going up and up for years, but world record is good news. Well, what makes this significant is that it's the race's first record breaker since 2019, pre-pandemic, when the marathon raised £66.4 million. Before the pandemic, the marathon, as you say, was regularly breaking the record year on year, but fundraising figures didn't seem to be on a major rise until last year's event, 2023, when the funds raised were up by nearly five million on the previous year. The event organisers said that this was due to an increase in race participants, and this seems to ring true for this year's race too with a record-breaking 53,000 people running. Well, that's fantastic news. And I mean, if you think about how the marathon evolved through COVID-19, it was cancelled in 2020, then it was moved to October. And I think we can probably agree, even though we've had not a great start to the spring this year, running a marathon in October versus running a marathon in April, it's a slightly less fun prospect. So having that moved around was a bit of a problem. And also, you know, places were being limited and there were rules around social distancing for running. So this really does feel like the return to sort of marathon proper. And uh, it's great to see that returning a brilliant fundraising result for the sector. And another thing to note is that the marathon has actually retained its virtual offer as well. So that's been allowing participants to take part from their home areas, even if they're not able to get into London for the official race, which has allowed a boost in participants too. Absolutely. And it's great to still see that being included. Yeah, it's also fantastic news given the challenges of the current fundraising climate. If anybody who's been listening to our sister podcast documentary series, The End of Charity, this week we covered in some depth the difficulties faced by one particular charity, West Norfolk Carers, which looked like it was going to have to close its doors just because all of its different fundraising channels, including individual donor fundraising stream was just going down and down and down. So it's fantastic to see that an event like this, like the London Marathon, is breaking records year on year. Absolutely. My favourite marathon moment is always the zany story that comes out. There's always at least one zany marathon story for me. My personal favourite this year is the story of Daniel Fairbrother. Daniel ran the London Marathon this year with a fridge strapped to his back. I saw him. Wow, yeah. You saw him yes. go by? Yes. They actually, actually my house. you were on the marathon route. Right, so he carried a fridge, which he named Tallulah, on his back to raise funds for Diabetes UK. But of course, in doing this, he had to train. And uh, in January, he was actually pulled over by police in Stevenage, who thought he was a thief, <laughs> because they saw him running in the middle of the night with a big fridge strapped to his back. <laughs> And um, there was a a bit of a misunderstanding there. He says they did uh, actually just let him go with a handshake (laughs) rather than giving him any kind of caution. But in fact, Daniel then made headlines again over the weekend because he actually proposed to his girlfriend at Big Ben. So, you know, a successful race. And uh, congrats to Daniel from everyone at Third Sector as well. Quite the story. Beautiful story. Moving on to this week's main feature. It's been a challenging time for several years now for those working in the volunteering world. We had Julie Bentley, who's the chief executive of Samaritans, on the podcast last November, and she told us how Samaritans lost 30% of their volunteers during the pandemic, and they were by no means alone, as many people who have volunteered for years found themselves reassessing how they spent their time. Plus, the country's volunteer base is in general getting older. There have, of course, been a number of initiatives to try and reverse this trend, including the Big Help Out, which is now entering its second year. 
So in light of these challenges, this week we're going to talk about best practice in volunteer management to help charities support their volunteers and make the experience as mutually beneficial as possible. We're delighted to be joined by two guests. First up is Holly Penalva, the founder and former chief executive of Indigo Volunteers, which over the past 10 years has placed thousands of volunteers with grassroots nonprofits in 11 countries. She's now the volunteer development manager at the disaster relief charity Shelterbox. Hi, Holly. Hi, thank you so much for having me today. It's great to have you with us. And also joining us in the studio is Karolina Praskova, who is a volunteer at Climate Ed. That's a charity which is almost entirely volunteer run, and it delivers workshops in London schools to educate young people about climate change. Thank you so much for coming in. Hi, guys. Thank you for having me. So let's start at the beginning of a volunteer's journey at the recruitment stage. So Holly, how, in your opinion, can charities best manage the volunteer recruitment stage? That's a really great question and so key because, you know, if you get this part wrong, (laughs) you're off to a pretty bad start, of course. So you really want to invest time into getting this part right. And there's many aspects to think about with the recruitment phase. First of all, where are you going to share about this role that you're thinking of? And how are you going to talk about it? Because a lot of the ways we talk about job descriptions, this doesn't just apply for volunteers, this applies for all roles, you know, paid staff as well. It can be quite a lot about the what, what you're going to do and not the why. And I think that is missing in so many role profiles is why would someone be excited to join this charity and to do this role and support? So I think getting to more of the why and less of the what is quite key. Then where are you going to promote this? And that's also really important because I think just using the same channels, you're already in your, your bit of a bubble. You've already got those supporters and maybe they've considered it before and they, they can't do it. So diversifying the platforms of where you advertise and at Indigo, we've got quite a, a long list of, of platforms which we're happy to share should anyone want them. Thinking about also the, the, the process of do you want to do phone screenings or the actual application form? Like, are you asking key questions that you really want answered? Because even recently, where I'm working now, I had someone who was eliminating people on the application based on that some people had put desirable answers But that was in addition, it wasn't actually answering one of the questions. And she said, oh, I like those answers. I said, but you didn't ask those other people that question. So it's not fair. So if you really want to know something, get that in there at the beginning. And you can keep it quite simple and straightforward because even having an application, although it can take a bit of time to do, a short time, you're already giving people that kind of test rather than sending a blanket, here's my CV with no thought behind it. They're having to really think about their answers. And am I going to invest my time and take this step to apply to this charity I think it can save you a lot of time and then thinking of the phone screenings and then the interviews again think outside of the box sometimes with the questions sometimes it's important to have strengths and weaknesses and and seeing if people are able to self-reflect and so on but just thinking of actual questions that might relate more to your charity and be brave think outside the box of some of those questions and and dare to ask something you might find a bit strange just to find out a little bit more about that person and we say what's a good day look like for you what's your what's your dream day and you find out that that person's hobbies and passions and most of it involves a glass of wine at the end of the day but that's quite fun you know so that's my very top level kind of advice around recruitment Thank you so much. Really thorough and loads to unpack there. So Carolina, coming at this from your perspective, now you work full time, but you also volunteer at Climate Ed. Tell us, how did you find out about this role and what was it that drew you to this charity, to wanting to give your time and make that commitment as Holly was just talking about? Yes. So for me, it was a bit of more, I would say, personal direction because As you mentioned, I work full time, but I also study part time sustainability and environmental studies. So I was really trying to find a like minded community and more likely charity based community that is related to sustainability or all related to climate. So I was lucky enough to find Climate Ed on LinkedIn when I was browsing and looking for some charity jobs. And I did apply. I have immediately within, I think, the next day received a response back from Ben, who is the founder of Climate Ad. And we scheduled straight away sort of an interview, like introduction, why obviously I am interested and 
why he would have chosen me to be as a volunteer for his charity or for this charity. So, yeah, it was really just based on my interests and just be surrounded by like-minded people, create new connections, networking as well, and obviously deliver that message that is quite important for me about climate. So I believe everyone should kind of like join charity that is personal for them. What, what do they like? Do they like to help people? Do want, they, they want to spread a word about something that is related to their jobs or their um, hobbies who knows so that was really yeah one of my main reasons I think you're absolutely right and I think this is something that is so unique about volunteering is it's not just that very basic human instinct to sort of give back to make the world a better place but when you dig down into people who volunteer so often they will have that really personal motivation whether it's that they want to volunteer for a health charity because they had a family member or a friend who experienced the condition that that health charity relates to or as you say whether they're passionate about the climate, which particularly young people are today. And so I guess that's also an important part of sort of building that into that recruitment process. And I guess, what does a great day look like for you? Maybe that's unpacking that personal element of why someone is motivated to get involved. And great as well that Climate Ed responded so quickly to your application and jumped on your enthusiasm and got that process going the very next day. So the charity has put out a call for volunteers and has received fantastic candidate like Carolina, who's really passionate, fits with your area of study, with your personal interests, with your passions, with your priorities. You've now got them in. Let's talk about the induction phase. Holly, what have you found to be necessary and important and successful in terms of inducting volunteers? Yeah, number one, do one (laughs) because not every charity actually finds the time surprisingly it's again so much of what I talk about is around investment I've run a charity for over a decade I know how hard it is to find the time for things I really empathize but it just really saves you so much time in the future if you are doing a proper recruitment phase and onboarding phase in my experience it includes to be as interactive as possible and and setting that culture from the beginning of being open to questions, being open to feedback, being open to constructive feedback, hopefully. But you need to set that tone at the very beginning with volunteers, that inclusivity, value and making them feel heard and appreciated. That's got to be there from the very, very beginning. And hopefully even from the interview process from when they first interact with with your your organisation. And also around the the values and the mission and the the vision and the the strategy because people like to know why they're doing something the direction they're going so really important to include those aspects in it and of course if you've got any budget I know charities are all different budgets and sizes but around merchandise or for example at Shelterbox when uh, we recruit an ambassador uh, they get sent a couple of, like a solar light, for example, so they can see what are the products that our charity actually has in the field that they give to people. And they can play with the solar light and see how the quality of it and how good it is. So when they're actually going around and talking about the charity, they can really advocate for it in a more passionate way. So if there's anything like that that you can also do, I, I highly advise, and anything that people can see, because it's just so motivating. So even if your job might be helping with the bookkeeping, bookkeeping for a homeless charity. If there's a way that you can show that volunteer still the facilities, the sites, the services you offer, that is so much more motivating for that person. So include all of these things in the, in the onboarding that you can think of. I don't see why it should be different to a staff member other than you might reduce some of the things, right? You might, you might give snippet versions depending on the role and so on. I don't see why volunteers should be treated differently to staff members in that sense. They should get the information they need and and complete transparency as well. But again, this is part of culture. I'm a big fan of uh, open, transparent uh, cultures. So that's some of my tips. (laughs) Yeah, you you hit the nail on the head there, which I really think is like the importance of actually professionalising volunteer roles. They are just as important, just as valuable. Yes, you might, as you say, make some adjustments, but the idea that you would ever onboard a full-time or a part-time salaried employee and not give them an induction is just intensely peculiar. And so why do that for volunteers? 
Yeah. So Carolina, based on what Holly's just said, I would love to hear about kind of your interactions sort of with Climate Ed and tell us a bit about kind of what it is that keeps you motivated to keep giving your time every week besides your obvious personal drive to fulfill this mission. How does the charity keep you engaged? So it's very basic, I would say. The charity or Ben actually himself, mm. he's always the one communicating with all of us. So he would just send out quarterly the like emails with an Excel spreadsheet, let's say, where all the schools are based, whoever wanted to have us as volunteers to obviously present the workshops and everything. And we then agree, for example, I've picked obviously school that is nearest from my home so that whenever I would work from home, I could find that obviously period of time where I could just, you know, during my lunchtime, let's say, I would just pack myself and go to the school to present the workshop. So it's really easy communication via emails mainly just picking the schools but obviously because this was my really first time doing the actual workshop I needed kind of an observation session with one of the volunteers who was obviously more experienced and done the workshops beforehand just for me to have an idea obviously how it all works and how it goes because given the fact English is my second language as well there is always a bit of stress and you're presenting in front of kids but you have to take it as a, as a audience regardless of their age and it needs to make sense you need to make sure you come prepared and obviously you know keep them engaged as well which is not all the time easy from what I've experienced but yeah I would say the communication is very as I said basic but just you know sometimes a simple way is is the best way and We've all put our names, we agree with Ben which school to go to, then he contacts the school himself and then it's up to us completely to take over, be in touch with the with the teacher, let's say, arrange a day that works the best for them and time as well. Obviously kind of like mid middle way that works for both sides and we just take it on from there. Sounds like you're given quite a high level of ownership in terms of the role that you're carrying out and you're not being... Mm micromanaged not at all not at all yes we do have really a free hand of course we receive the notes and the presentations with the material that is obviously being given and what each session basically is based on each topic but then it kind of is repeating after and we just do kind of an overview and what we've learned so far so we do have a free hand I would say I sometimes try to add something what I've learned so far from my uni or setting that I think find it useful and it's just like input because sometimes the wording could be a bit difficult for the children to understand of course so you just try to find a little bit better version of how to explain to them but in general it's completely up to us to how we deliver the workshop and if we feel like there is an engagement from the children and Ben of course wants to have that feedback back like is there something we need to improve do you think we need to maybe like get rid of something so it's very open-minded and, and yeah, we do have a free hand in that. That's great. And of course, we vitally need people like you making these contributions to our society and pushing forward those causes that we care about. We do know, of course, that life gets in the way. At the moment, this is a particularly febrile time for the charity sector. The cost of living crisis is changing people's priorities. You know, people don't necessarily have the time that they had, say, during the COVID-19 pandemic to give to causes that they care about. And as Lucinda said at the top of this episode, you know, Samaritans saw their volunteer base fall by a third, which is big numbers. And that's a major loss for the sector. So, Holly, I'd love to know if you recruit a brilliant volunteer like Carolina, what are the kind of best tips that you can offer for then retaining those volunteers and keeping those people with you for the long term? I mean, it's, it's the million dollar question. I, I think from just taking snippets of from what I've, I've said already, they're really important around treating people like their staff, but hopefully you also treat your staff really well as well. So they are people, they've got their own things going on, valuing uh, their opinions, making sure they feel heard. All of these things are so important, but we should do this with all human interactions, right? So I'm hopefully not saying anything new, but unfortunately, we really don't see this a lot, this best practice with volunteers. They can often be even seen as a bit of a nuisance. And if that is the case, then then 
something's not going right and that whole process needs to be reviewed because they should be seen as an asset and as I say if that's not the case then let's take a step back and, re- and review why it's all based around trust and trusting your volunteers that they're going to do a good job and if you don't trust them again take a step back why and do you need a conversation with that person yeah so it's all about connection relationships communication and giving everybody involved in an organization a sense of the ownership of of what it is that they're doing and Carolina I wondered if we could go to you now and I understand that Climate Ed puts on certain social meetings and things for its volunteers how important is that to you and what does it look like yes so funny that you said that because i've literally just received yesterday email from ben so we've got another social event at the headquarters of greenpeace which is in islington it's in may and of course i do believe it is important to socialize as i said again before with like-minded people so that you can just sort of connect and share feedback or just you know you greet new volunteers which in the in that case it was also for me whenever I've joined climate ad you do feel that you know you're being this newbie and you just want to really be part of that community so I definitely think that socializing is so important creating these events for volunteers as well but on the other hand it's also difficult to find probably the best time that will work for everyone because again we are all busy like it's definitely essential to the to the organization and just really to share feedback create some new connections as I said and yeah just really you know feel welcome I think it's very very important absolutely Um, of course you know sometimes people can for different reasons move on and it happens it happens in you know, salaried employment, it happens for volunteers as well. Having covered that sort of full arc of volunteer journeys, Holly, I would love to hear your thoughts on the importance of exit interviews. When volunteers do decide to leave, what can charities, what can the organisations actually gain from doing those? They are so important. Again, though, you really have to have a culture in your organisation of of open-mindedness and receiving feedback well. That person's placement might have gone brilliantly and they tell you everything's great, that's good, but you're not learning anything. It's very unlikely 100% went well. I mean, in fact, it's impossible when it, it, that's 100% went well. So you do really want to hear from the small to the big. So definitely who's conducting that exit interview, making sure that it's set in a way that makes that person feel the interviewee be, be comfortable and, and that you're really expressing at the beginning, we want to improve, we want to hear your feedback. Please do tell us if it's small or big in a way that... Maybe you have a solution, maybe you don't, but just tell us anyway. And just covering all the bases again, like mine are quite thorough. They can be up to an hour long, but you really learn a lot. And you also get a lot of good feedback. It's quite motivating. And you can, I type up the notes and uh, as I go and I copy and paste some of the things to the team. And it's like, wow, they really particularly loved the support from this person. Let's everyone give them a high five. You know, like it can also be really motivating. But if you want to grow which every organisation should have that mindset. You really have to do exit interviews. And the timing is also interesting, whether you do it straight away or you wait a bit, pros and cons to both, because that person's got a bit of time to reflect as well, but maybe they're less engaged to accept them. Just thinking about that. Yeah, and as I say, who's doing it? Is the person conducting it likely to get the most honest responses from that individual, especially thinking about power balances, maybe the volunteer is a bit too scared to reveal everything to if it's if it's with someone the CEO for example hopefully not but just you do need to be aware of that yeah some really good things to think about there and just on a parting note you've talked quite a bit about your own experiences of managing volunteers in your leadership role but you must have a pretty unique perspective over multiple charities, given what Indigo Volunteers were set up to do in terms of placing volunteers with multiple organisations. And I just wondered if you could share an example of a charity or another organisation that you've worked with, which has really excelled in their volunteer management. And why was that? Yeah, there's a couple that come to mind of our partners. So what we do at Indigo is match make the process so we we get volunteers applied to us and then match them with one of our partners and 
we do require minimum standard from all of our partners, otherwise they, we couldn't have them as partners. But those that excel are those that I suppose do an accumulation of everything I've, I've spoken around. So great communication from the start, like responding straight away. And even someone applies and doesn't get it, that position, still replying to them because they are human and they need to know that their their email's even been received and that they haven't got it. And what we did at Indigo is we, we would usually if appropriate try and give a bit of feedback like very just a, a light thing but you know we try and be as encouraging as possible because it's a horrible thing to obviously apply for something and be declined and it can hit you your soul a little bit can't it so just trying to be encouraging and, and supportive the partners that come to mind are those that are, are exactly that supportive kind respond well treat the volunteers with respect they deserve have clear role definitions clear responsibilities and let them have autonomy, let them get on with their role and trust them in that role. Brilliant. Well, it's been so great to get both of your thoughts on this very important topic. So Holly and Carolina, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, that's it for this week. We'll be talking about volunteering once again at the end of next month, thinking about some of the topical issues facing the sector as a warm-up for Volunteers Week. Next week, we'll be joined by Mary Rose Gunn from The Four to talk about funding for small charities. Please do join us then. But for now, thank you to our guests, Holly and Carolina, and our producer, Navpal.